Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Janari and this is Great Big History Podcast. In this episode of 10 Questions, we do industrializations. Duis ex machina. The God is in the machine. So what is industrialization? Our first question. And what it is, is the replacement of muscle power with machine power. Not animal power, but machine power. And what is the effect of this on people's consumption? Well, you have a massive increase in production, which equals cheaper prices for goods, which equals much higher consumption. Productivity and consumption skyrockets, so more people are able to afford more stuff for the first time, and you get better living. Take a look at a supermarket and all the stuff it has. Look at Walmart and how much stuff it has. So what is the effect of industrialization on skilled labor? Well, skilled labor, their wages go up because the labor was important and less people could do the jobs that were defined as skilled. So you get a creation of a managerial class. This is the, quote, white collar class of managers, lawyers, financial workers, college professors. It's people with university training who lead other people. It's people who make their money by doing a job that requires brain power. And if you're watching the video, you can see that after around 1900, from, from like 1850 to 1900, the income, the real wages for skilled workers is going up very good. And then after 1900, it just explodes. It's eight times between 1900 and 2000 what it had been in 19 or 1800, 1850. So there's that group of people. But there's also another group of people who are skilled labor. So there's, there's the edu there's university trained, educated class, the managerial class. There's also the skilled blue collar workers. These are people who make money with their hands, but they can fix the machines that the managerial and ownership class rely on. So it's a new middle class of people using brain power as opposed to the business ownership or inheritance of the past, or it's a new group using training and skill and still knowledge to fix the machines that are now required to do the work. So what are the effects of industrialization on unskilled labor? The people who are actually using the machines, well, they get poor, their wages go down. Despite there being more jobs and despite there being more stuff that they can afford to buy, they are actually getting poorer because the machines do the work. And since unskilled labor now monitors the machines, they do a job anyone can do with a little bit of training. So workers have no power to demand increases in wages or less time working, which means the only way to make more money is to send more members of your family to work, your wife, your children. Women and children going to work in the same field suppresses wages for the men, which means more women and more children have to go out to work, which suppresses wages even more. This robs children of the time for education. This robs women of the female protections from male society. They now become dependent on men and the treatment of men in a male space, the factory. See how well that works for Fantine in Les Mis, where her boss sexually harasses her and makes her job dependent on whether or not she will have sex with him. This also leads to a bit of disconnect between the idea of poverty and especially conservative society. Because it's going to be conservative society that's going to be asked to fix this, and we'll get to that later. But you get the idea that 
well, if you're poor, you shouldn't afford anything. You shouldn't have anything. You should be destitute because that's the way people used to be. They had rags. And so you'll see things on conservative media that go, oh, look, how many poor people, poor, quote, unquote, have a television, 96%. How many people on welfare have a cell phone, 81%. How many people on welfare have a refrigerator, 98%. And it'll be like, if they're so poor, why do they have this stuff? Well, the answer is, is industrialization. The answer is, is that a cell phone is relatively cheap to get. It just costs a large percentage of their income to get it. But how do you live at all in an American apartment without a refrigerator? Right? And so you'll see you're not poor because you have stuff. But industrialization changed that dynamic. Industrialization is perfectly happy being able to produce something that even poor people can afford. It's not well made. It's not going to last. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but it does function for a time. And so what we see is for poor people, their lives in a lot of ways get, if not worse, poorer, more vulnerable. And more people now go out and do manual labor. More women do it, more children do it. Now, that's not to say women and children didn't work out on the farm. That's not, of course they did. Poor women have always worked. But now they're entering these male spaces, these industrialized male spaces. And that leads to lots of social problems that, interestingly enough, it's conservatives who are going to worry about. So what are our problems of industrialization? Well, we have urban poverty. For the first time, cities are poor. Or they have very poor zones. See, cities are places of trade, of merchants, of buying and selling of goods, of the making of goods. So ever since Babylon, while there are poor people who may live in cities, the city itself is a, is a rich place, is a wealthy place. But now you get places or parts or large parts of of cities downtown, the Bowery, right below Wall Street in New York, the East End in London, that are just poor and full of poor working people. These are not people who aren't working. They are working, and they're still poor. So you get urban poverty. You also get massive pollution, so these machines need power, so they burn coal. They burn Later, they'll burn oil. They produce pollution. And that poverty plus pollution can kill you much earlier. The life expectancy in London was 37 years of age. It was much healthier to live outside of London than to live in it. In fact, we see that in the art. The whole kind of impressionism, especially London and English-based impressionism, you see it in the colors, in how it's portrayed. It looks like you can barely see Whitehall, Westminster Abbey. You could barely see these things through the haze that is pollution. Read the poetry of this era of the 1830s, 1840s. Tennyson, for example, and it's it talks about how how just polluted you could see the air, right? Jack the Ripper is the same way. It's never bright and sunshiny in a Jack the Ripper story. It's hazy. It's fog. But London doesn't get fog. London doesn't naturally get fog. That's all pollution. And you know who doesn't want to live around that? Rich people. The people who own the factories, and by extension, the managerial classes, are going to want to live away from poor people, away from the pollution. And so they move 
to less polluted areas. They move to the countryside. They move out of the cities. See Camden and Haddonfield. Camden is far more industrialized, far more dense, far more polluted. And five miles away, outside of Camden, outside the city center of Camden, Camden is Haddonfield, one of the richest suburbs, one of the richest zip codes in the country, with parks and trees and shade and churchyards. And no high-rise buildings. So wealthy people move farther away. They physically separate themselves. Plus, education is needed to enter the middle class. So here's a pro. So the problem is urban poverty, urban pollution urban death, the separation of rich from poor, that the education, so this is the one, two, three, four, fifth problem of industrialization is, the education that you needed to get into the middle class, you couldn't afford. You couldn't go, just anybody couldn't go to Eden and then to Cambridge or Oxford or, or uh, East Anglia. Only the wealthy could get in. Or if you were middle class enough, you got in by debt, which is still true today. You're either getting in because your family is wealthy or you're getting in by debt to stay, to hang out with the wealthy. What about the city daily newspaper? That's a new innovation. There, there were newspapers before, but... Now we get the daily newspaper, we get the city, we get the London Times, for example, the daily news, right? Who's reading that? Well, most people can't read, so it's not the regular folk. So who's reading it? The wealthy are reading it. The upper middle classes are reading it. The managerial class are reading it. Why? Well, they're trying to understand the enormity of the new city. London doubles in size and then doubles again. There's also fear, the fear of the poor. There's too many poor, too many immigrants, whether national immigrants coming from other parts of the country or international immigrants coming from other countries who speak different languages and have different cultures. There's drugs. There's a moral crisis and prostitution. There's this idea that crime is everywhere. And the city daily newspaper gives you a gritty realism. It is written in a style that is not flourish, that is not like Victorian novels, despite there literally being columns by Charles Dickens in it. But it's written in this gritty realism of the everyday. It reflects a place verging on chaos in plain language. There's only so many column inches. There's only, wor only so many words that can fit. And so you had to get, you had to cut if you're a writer of, in a newspaper or an editor, you had to cut down to what was the essential piece of knowledge. You get a headline that grabs the eye, and then you get a first paragraph. And then after that, you have to hold their attention. We get Dickens, who will pre-publish parts of his novels in newspapers, telling rich folks how to live, how to treat other people, how other people live. He's not the only one. There are many writers who are also doing this because they know who's reading the paper. And so if you if you're want to help the poor, you write about their plights to the rich in a language that the rich can understand. Sherlock Holmes novels come out as this logic and reason can prevail over chaos. The Sherlock Holmes novel is all about that, that there's chaos. There are crimes that are happening that one cannot understand. They don't make any sense. That's Watson. Watson's looking at it going, I don't understand how this happened. And Sherlock's like, elementary, my dear Watson, we just have to logically, not with emotion, not with fear, just pace it out. Piece by piece by piece. Logic. 
well, why would Sherlock Holmes come out in this day and age of industrialization and mass urbanization? It's because the city, London, is chaos. It looks like chaos. It looks like it's uncontrollable. Well, Babylon looked that way. Rome looked that way. Athens looked that way. Every city, to the people who are in it, who are especially wealthy people, looks like it's too many poor people, too much crime. You know, look at the Code of Hammurabi, the first written law code. Something like, is it a third? Deals with theft? Deals with businesses and theft? So the idea of Sherlock Holmes is that logic and reason can prevail. That it isn't a world of chaos. It looks like it, but it's actually not. So what are Dickens's and American progressivism's solutions to the industrialization problem? We have all of these problems, and we have progressives. We have liberals. And what are their answers? Their answers in England and in, in the UK, I shouldn't say England, in Britain, Great Britain and Ireland, and in America is, for lack of a better way of saying it, don't be a dick. Be nice. Pay well. Be Christian. Remember that you have obligations to others. You have tiny Tim Cratchit who says, God bless us, every one. It's to remind you that the city it dehumanizes people. You don't know people. There's too many people. You're walking by them. They're strangers, but they're all people. They're all humans living their lives. And it reminds you to be Christian in the kind of classic version of that, to care about other people as you would care about yourself. And so we see this in A Christmas Carol. The Christmas Carol is the great don't be a dick novel or novella. It is, you know, Fozziewig from The Muppet Christmas Carol versus Scrooge. Fozziewig, it's, it is Christmas. It is a time for generosity. While Scrooge calls Christmas a poor excuse to pick a man's pocket. Right? There's a scene where the ghost of Christmas past says to Scrooge, having seen Fozziewig start the party, the Christmas party, he says, come on, this isn't a big deal. Why is everyone so happy? You know, the ghost is being ironic. Fozziewig has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Why is that so much that he deserves this praise, that he's the master of the feast? And Scrooge says, it isn't that. It isn't the money. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light of burdens, of burdensome, or a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. To which the ghost of Christmas past gives him a big side eye. Mm hmm. Do you see the connection with you there, uh, Scrooge? The idea of both in the UK and in America of these progressive ideas, and it's called progressivism, it's, it's a liberalism called progressivism. And, a, and it is conservative. It is Teddy Roosevelt. It is people who are rich, who should be conservatives going, we've got to change. We'll talk about the liberals in a second, but American progressivism is like the center left, except it's pulling from the center right. It's people who are going, morality matters. And it's harder to enforce or rely upon it as cities and wealth grow. But you still have to be moral. So you bring in with it a modern noblesse oblige. The idea that the successful, the rich, and thus government. Because remember, who's voting for government? Who runs government? You have the king. You have the prime minister. You have the uh, political parties. The people who are voting aren't poor people. The people who are voting are wealthy are middle class, are people of means. 
because they have the time to participate in elections. They have the time to participate in politics. So the idea is they have an obligation to help the poor, to help the people. And here's where the the conservatism comes in. Noblesse oblige is by, by definition conservative. And it's the idea that the rich have an obligation to help the poor. See Christianity. But remember, in 1850, there's also nobody wants a second French Revolution. The French Revolution murdered most of the rich people of France and a whole lot of rich people in other places and then plunged the entire continent into war and destroyed everything. So you have to help the poor people in at, at the very least out of self-interest so that you don't have another French Revolution. What's the liberal, what's Marx's, Karl Marx's solution to industrialization's problems? Marx and Engels, who are German, they're Germans living in Britain. Engels has inherited a factory where Marx and Engels get to kind of test out their theories. And we're going to get the Communist Manifesto. We're going to get Capital out of this. And I want to start with kind of an aside. Marx and Engels have, bar none, the best critique of capitalism anywhere, of anybody. They know what's wrong with capitalism. Anybody who comes after, who says, you know what the problem with capitalism is, is basically either picking something out of the Communist Manifesto or out of Capital. They have it. And that's why it's big in academia. That's why there's Marxists in academia. Well, even after the Soviet Union collapses, it's not that they want a Soviet country. It's not that they want Leninism. It's that the critique that the rich are against the poor, that capitalism serves capital and not people, those critiques that Marx and Engels have are correct. The problem with Marx and Engels, if you think there's a problem, is with what they come up as the solutions. And we'll talk about those in a second. But their critique, they're sitting around having a beer going, you know what's wrong with capitalism? They're right. I mean, Marx and Engels, they're smart guys. They got it. Bernie Sanders' critique is the same as Marx's. The solutions, of course, are different. And what is their solution? A French revolution in the factory. The workers need to seize the means of production because without workers, nothing gets made. They need to take over. Why should the owner make most of the profit? Why should the owner make the money on the shares of stocks? Why should the owner be the only one or the shareholders be the only one who benefit? from the success of the company, while the workers are paid a wage, which is easily taken away, and they are easily removed. Do not the workers make the product? And so the idea is the workers are going to have to seize the means of production. They're going to have to own the factory. And then they could divide up the profits more equitably, or maybe even evenly. Now, There's a difference between equitable and even. Even is the same for everybody. Equitably means those who deserve more get more, but everybody ends in kind of the same space. We'll we'll talk about equity and and equality and the difference between them when we get to the uh, Great Depression because it comes up again and we'll do it again when we hit civil rights. You know, when you say everyone should be treated the same, you say, okay, but what about the people who need more help? What about the people who are poorer? What about the people who invested more of their time or do a more dangerous part of the job? Do not they deserve more? That's questions of equity. Evenly says everyone gets the same. We all own 10% of the company, so we all get 10% no matter what job we do. So the idea is the workers need to seize the means of production because without workers, nothing gets made. Plus, you need to divide up the profits 
more equitable, equitably or evenly because without everyone, no one makes money. You need everybody. You need the managers. You need the workers. You need the secretaries. You need the people who are shipping the product. You need the people who are bringing in the resources to make the product. You need the lunch counter people because if you take a break and you go and you eat lunch, you need them to be doing their work too. You need every, you need the people to clean up at the end of the day. You need everybody. So workers need to overthrow government. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We had a French revolution in the factory. Why are we now having a French revolution in the government? And not only that, we have to replace it with the Rousseauian collective, if anything. Maybe we don't replace it with anything. Maybe we just replace it with like us, like making decisions as a democratic collective where we all have an equal say. So workers are going to need to overthrow their government in order to replace it with a Rousseauian collective and probably need to overthrow all governments since all governments are exploitive. And great, you overthrow your government and you create a wonderful worker paradise collective. The country next door might wage war on you to stop you from doing that. That is exactly what happened in the French Revolution. In 1792, the French Revolution was going fine. And then Austria and Prussia invaded in order to stop the French Revolution, get rid of French rights, and put the French king back on the throne. And that's when craziness happened. That's when the poop hit the fan of the French Revolution. I'm not saying everything was great, but it was a revolution like we had seen in other places. But after that, woo, the French Revolution becomes the French Revolution. So, so you're probably going to need to overthrow old governments. So, no small task, right? Now, why? Why do you need to overthrow the government? Because in democratic governments, democratic politicians are dependent upon the wealth of the rich to get elected. It's no, it was true in the 1850s. It's true today. You have to run. You have to get a majority of people in your district to vote for you. So you need to tell them who you are and what your ideas are. You have to advertise. Advertising costs money. And most politicians don't have the money. And if they did, they'd be rich. So middle class politicians don't have the money, which means they have to go to rich people. You can't go to poor people. They don't have the money. So you have to go to rich people and make deals with the rich people. And guess what those deals are? Lower taxes, less regulation, more independence. Rich people who own companies have not changed in 5,000 years. They want less taxes on themselves. They don't care about taxes on other people. They want less regulation of their business so they could do more and it costs them less. And, you know, they do need safety. They do need security. So they need the government to kind of protect them as well. And so if the workers ever strike, see the Homestead strike of 1892 or the railroad strike of 1877, governments actually use their policies to protect the wealthy using violence. So in Ohio, in the Homestead strike, the Ohio uh, state militia was called out. We call it the National Guard, but it was the state militia with guns to shoot striking workers. Same thing, I think, with the railroad strike. A state militia was called out to shoot the strikers, reopen the factory, and punish the workers that had stopped working. Well, because Andrew Carnegie called up the governor of Ohio and said, call out the state militia, and they did. So Marx is looking at that going, there's an alliance between the rich and government. They're stuck with each other. The, the government needs the rich, rich's money, and the rich are perfectly willing to get something for their investment, and that is protection, violent protection. So if the workers are ever going to have equity, they're going to have to overthrow the rich in the factories, but when they try to do that, the rich are going to call in the state militia, they're going to call in the government to protect them, which means you... In the end, you're just going to have to overthrow government anyway to protect yourself. 
So you can see why that's a problem for conservatives, right? This is a Marx's idea is a complete revolution of society, right? In order for workers to do well, to make a living wage, to, to succeed, to be part of the system, instead of being exploited, they have to overthrow the system. Conservatives are not going to like that. So what is the conservative solution to industrialization's problems? Like, it's not. Like, Teddy Roosevelt and plenty of rich people look at industrialization, and they know this problems. I mean, they can see it. They're not blind, and, they, and they're certainly not dumb. Like, Carnegie is going to spend a lot of money on libraries. He does not pay higher wages, but he does build a lot of libraries and, you know, funds Carnegie Mellon University and things like that. And the idea was reform capitalism. And this is the age of the great democratic reforms. The income tax, the progressive income tax, that is higher on rich people than it is on poor people. In fact, when the first income taxes happened, they didn't happen on poor people at all. More democracy for male citizens. So you get the voting for more parts of government. You get the voting for senators in the United States. Now, we're not at women voting, though in some places in the United States, you do get women voting. In Wyoming in the 1870s, women could vote. They couldn't vote in federal elections. They could vote in state elections. So in some places, you do get uh, female voting as well. But the idea is you let more and more and more poor people vote. And eventually, you get the universal male suffrage. So by 1900, both the United States and Britain have universal male suffrage. All men can vote. Well, in the United States, all white men can vote. You get the 12-hour day down from the 16-hour workday to the 10-hour workday to the 8-hour workday. The idea, the conservative solution to industrialization's problems was to make life better for regular people so that they don't rebel. Look at saboteurs. Look at Luddites. These were people that literally destroyed the machines they were working on. The saboteurs threw their wooden shoes, sabat, into the machines. Destroy the machine. That's a cost. The machine is shut down for days or weeks, maybe months. The owner doesn't make any money. The owner still has expenses and debts because capitalism is expensive. Building a factory is expensive. Buying those machines are expensive. He still has to pay his credit card bills. So it's in the owner's, the conservative owner's interest to not have a rebellion especially a French Revolution, where you lose your head. Remember, it's just a generation ago. This is the 1850s. Napoleon is defeated in 1815. We're talking, a gen we're talking Grandpapa fought in the wars. So it's, it's, the French Revolution is recent for these people. But at the same time, you try to limit immigration, the Chinese Exclusion Act. You have labor exclusion from cities. You have health exclusions. The idea is to protect the demographics, protect certain jobs. And you use disease as an excuse, disease and germs that are just being discovered. Use them as an excuse. We still do that today. That's Title 42 for COVID to keep um, immigrants from south of the Rio Grande whether they be Mexican, Central American, or South American, from coming into the United States. And the idea of limiting immigration is that you protect native workers from lower-priced competition. Now, that's a cost for capitalism. Capitalism wants to pay workers as little as possible. So the idea that you'll limit immigration means there'll be less competition for the job, which means wages will rise, which is a cost. But the idea is you are making an alliance with the native labor group. In the United States, it's um, white. It's, your, it's white men of European descent. In uh, Britain, it would be like, say, the English as opposed to the Irish or people from the colonies. But, and this is important, 
you also get new armed conservative groups to maintain control in the urbanizing landscapes. And they are allowed to use violence against certain, quote, troublemakers. You get the police in London and then in New York. The police are you pay rich people, pay poor people to protect rich people from other poor people. And you pay those poor people enough that they no longer have to live with the poor people they police. So the so what happens is, say, in New York, in Manhattan, right? The poor people live below, you know, Fifth Street, right? I can go into Houston and such, but you don't know, you may not know where that is. So let's just go Fifth Street, right? Fourth, Fifth Street, right? The rich people have moved out of that territory. We've talked about that with pollution and such. They've moved out, right? So they move up to 15th Street. What they end up doing is moving out to the 30s, to the 30th. Madison, you know, Park Avenue, you're in the 30s, right? Right below Central Park. You pay the police, you poor, poor people, you pay the poor Irish to police other Irish, but you pay them enough that now the police can move out of that area below 5th Street and move into that 6th through 25th Street area. They are literally in the middle between the poor and the rich, thus the middle class. We didn't have middle classes before. If you listen to my entire 101 section, we never really talk about the middle class. There's a merchant class, and it's tiny. There's the rich, who are 2% of the population, and there's everybody else, the 98%. Now, industrialization is allowing there to be an actual middle class, a real group that lives separately from the poor, but they are not part of the rich. They're not accepted as part of the rich, but they certainly see themselves as not poor. Well, that's in urban areas. That's London, Paris, New York. What about in the rural areas? Especially in the United States, you get militias. You get conservative militias, armed groups, vigilante groups, whose job it is is to maintain racial supremacy, usually through violence and terror. The most famous group of this is the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, but regular police in the South and in the West and in parts of the North do the same. That's how you get lynchings. That's how you get to kill a mockingbird. Right? The trial of Mr. Robinson, who is the white people show up and they're like, the day before the trial, and they're like, Atticus, step aside. We're going we're gonna to murder this guy. We're going to sh- make him a lesson to all the other black people about staying away from white women. And Atticus doesn't. And then the kids show up and they kind of shame the adults into what they're going to do. You know? But the idea was it's a vigilante group of armed men. Armed white men. And their job is to maintain racial superi- superiority, but also cultural superiority. The Ku Klux Klan is not just against black people. It's against Jews, against Catholic immigrants. It's against anybody who is not them. It's trying to maintain a demographic, cultural, racial superiority and dominance in a world that was changing. You In Europe, especially in Eastern Europe, you get secret police, the intelligence services, anti-rebellions see because in the in in eastern europe you don't get democracy you don't get a labor party like you do in um britain and you don't get a party like you don't get a group like tammany hall who gained power explicitly like by going and getting the votes from poor immigrants or poor workers in exchange for making their lives a little bit better In the East, you have the king, and you have an absolutist king, an absolutist king in Germany, an absolutist king in Austria, an absolutist king in Russia. And so how do you maintain order? You have secret police. 
special units that are built to spy on anti-royal or pro-ethnic group independence. Because in the empires of Germany, Austria, and Russia, the controlling ethnic group is actually a minority versus all the other groups. I don't think Russians outnumber all the other people in in the Russian Empire. I don't think they do. That might be the one where they do, but if they do, they just, just barely. But the idea is you these different ethnic groups want independence too because of the French Revolution's emphasis on nationalism. Why should I, as a Hungarian, be told what to do by a German living in Vienna? So these secret police have the power to arrest, detain, torture, all outside the normal legal proceedings. They are allowed to use fear and terror to maintain order. Notice that that kind of rule applies to some special police services in the United States in the 21st century. We call them scorpion units, and we call them uh, black ops, and we call them, you know, these names that are all very masculine and kind of shady and kind of violent. And their idea is that they're not police. They're not there to protect and serve. They're there to root out. They're there to spy upon. They're there to find evil and rip it out of the society. No matter what the cost is. That's the secret. They are a secret. If they are driving around, not in cop cars and in plain clothes, they are a secret police. So you get these new forms of violence that didn't exist before and new groups that are authorized to use violence. Okay, well, what about the liberal response to this? The liberal response to industrialization? Well, we get romanticism. Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, Alc Alcott, and Thoreau. It's a very literary, philosophical reaction to industrialization and urbanization. And it's, it's, it's liberal, but it's not about changing industrialization. It's about ignoring it. So in some ways, it's also conservative. It's the countryside is better. The small town is better than the city. Traditions, feelings, nature are all better than the hustle and bustle and concrete of the cities. It's the value of slower life, known neighbors, personal connections, less pollution. So it's conservative in a lot of ways. It's liberal because it wants to be away from all this stuff. It wants to change all this stuff. It doesn't see industrialization as a good thing. But it's conservative in its idea that it wants to return to the way things were. It's a conservative philosophy. Now, look at Wordsworth's Lake District. If you're looking at the video, you'll see that my picture on the left is Wordsworth's Lake District. Well, if you woke up and that was your view, you wouldn't want to go to London either with all the pollution and the crime and the people. You'd be like, this is great. Why would anyone change? You're rich in a countryside looking at a giant lake. Life is good for you. We see it in Pride and Prejudice where Mr. Darcy goes to Lizzie and want, kind of asks her out on what is a 19th century, early 19th century version of a date. May I see you in the village? May I see you to the village? And she's like, no, I'm very fond of walking. And he's like, yes, I, uh, I know. Like, people don't walk? Why are they walking? Where is she walking? In the city, they walk. He's like, we're in the countryside. We're supposed to sit in the sitting room and play piano and talk and, and like do music. And like, you're walking around the countryside. Why are you doing this? So, you know, Louise May Alcott has Joe go to the city. She goes to the city to be a writer, to be independent, 
to be alone, right? All of her other sisters are like, whoa, I ain't going there. Crazy stuff happens at the city. Right? We're going to stay and we're going to get married or we're going to hang out with Aunt Polly and, right? We'll go to Paris, but like as a learning teaching exercise, not to live. Like then we come back, right? And so we have these different responses. Industrialization is the biggest change in human society since agriculture. It makes peak societies wealthy. Today, it's still, you have 30 industrialized countries of the 200 countries in the world. 30, 35 tops that live an industrialized lifestyle. And those people are the richest countries on the planet. So should all 200 countries become industrialized? Uh, we'll cook the planet. We're cooking the planet now at just 30. But it becomes the difference between subsistence poverty of farming for just a little bit, just to get by, and for the wealthy to get super wealthy, for there to be a new middle class that doesn't have to worry day to day what their, what their wealth is. They have enough money to last them a little while. If you lose your job as a manager, you might get by in a couple weeks, maybe a couple months. You're going to have to get another job. You are still poor. You're not independently wealthy. But you're also not poor in that you're living day to day. And because of this change, there are several change people who want to change. There's Marx who calls for revolution. There's the conservatives that call for reform. And there's the romantics that just say, ignore it, go away. Live a different lifestyle. You don't have to live in industrially. You don't have to live with the pollution. You can choose a different path. So we're still having those debates today. We'll talk about them more when we get to the Great Depression in part two of this course. So be safe. Take care. And this is the end of part one. Congratulations, everybody. You made part one. Woo! We're over. We're going to start off with imperialism. We're going to, Europe is going to take its industrialized might and start conquering places it had never conquered before. Uh, and But not send a lot of people there. They're just going to own the place and extract the resources. With few exceptions, Europeans really don't move into these places. Um. Then we are, so the Europeans are going to conquer the world. We're going to do Mary Poppins and um, the song Modern Major General. And we're going to show how great life is for Europeans. And then we're going to have the First World War. We're going to have the, the plague, the Spanish flu that's going to kill 20 million people. We're going to have the 20s, which is chaos. It's wealth and poverty. Then we're going to have the Great Depression in which capitalism dies. And then we're going to have World War. We're going to have fascism and communism and World War II. And we're going to kill 100 million people. So um, enjoy this moment because we're going to deal with some happy and some very dark stuff coming in part two. So be safe. Take care. And I'll see you soon.